It's quite a privilege for me to be invited uh, by my favorite media institution to this gathering. I published a book in, in November and spent the, uh, the two years, two and a half years before that, researching, gathering material for the book. I was challenged uh, recently on something that I had put in the book, and I had to go back to the literally thousands of documents and files and cuttings to check where I, to verify my facts. And I discovered that most of my files and documents came from the Daily Maverick, and that is quite a compliment. So ladies and gentlemen, here we are again, We're about to have a, another general election, the fifth general election since we became a doc democracy, coming just days after we celebrated our 20th birthday as a free nation. 77% of our eligible voters are registered to vote. That means about 25 million voters in total. About three quarters of them will cast their vote on 7 May, about 19 million people, pretty much without fear of intimidation or violence. Like we had done before, we will accept the fairness and legitimacy of the election and its results. It would help if Pansi Takula took a few weeks' leave. <laughs> it's a reminder that we are a stable and open society, more so than most outside the established democracies. The, the rule of law is guaranteed. We have no fear whatsoever that the military will get involved in the government that we will elect, as they had done in Egypt or even in Zimbabwe. We have no threats of terrorism, religious fundamentalism, ethnic or regional conflict. We have a black middle class of about six million adults, and some 400,000 of them are paying off their bonds and their homes. Now, all these are indicators uh, of stability. So much for the nonsense talk in recent weeks and months of a failing state or a banana republic. We indeed have a good story to tell. Not so much the governing party, but we as a people, as the South African nation. If you're one of those who would feel disturbed if the present governing party will again get over 60% of the vote on May the 7th, just relax. We have enough democratic tools to keep any government in check. Thanks to the magnificent constitution, that was the fruit of our negotiated settlement of 1994, a constitution, need I remind you and them, co-authored, even pioneered by the ANC. Among those tools are the guarantees of free speech and free independent media, an independent judiciary, the Constitutional Court, the Public Protector, the Auditor General, the Human Rights Commission, I can go on. We are a constitutional democracy, remember, not a parliamentary democracy, however much that fact irritates some politicians. One of the most heartening events or, or developments in the last few years was the reawakening of civil society that had become very vibrant and energetic. So when we are faced with the results of an investigation that found that some of our top politicians and bureaucrats gave themselves a license to loot, and that our president had, to put it very mildly, quietly condoned the spending of 250 million rand of public money on his private estate, we should all be angry, but at the same time, we should stop and remember that it was, a, it was our free media that had exposed the scandal in the first place, and that it was an institution of the state, of the constitution, that had investigated that scandal fearlessly and report, reported on it publicly. Nobody could stop us citizens expressing our outrage, often in very rude and disrespectful terms in public, and in the media, conventional and social. Again, this is not stuff that happens in a banana republic or a failing state. On top of that, the Speaker of the National Assembly of Parliament yesterday announced that there would be an ad hoc uh, committee investigating in Kandla. All good news. May I also remind you that on the same day that the public protector released her and Kandla the report, the Prime Minister of another esteemed democracy, Turkey, banned Twitter because of tweets alleging that he was a corrupt politician. We can't even imagine something like that happening in our society, can we? So given all these structural and constitutional strengths and stability, 
It is all the more disappointing that we as a nation have been so unsuccessful, that we have been so spectacularly underperforming the last 20 years. We have to ask this serious question on the eve of our democracy's 20th anniversary and our fifth general election. Is our stability, is our democratic culture more under threat in 2014 than they were in 1994? The facts are scary. More, more than a quarter of our employable citizens are without jobs. The education we had provided to especially our black youth over the last decades was worse than that even in even the poorest sub-Saharan country, despite us spending a lot more money. The result was that millions of young people are wandering around our townships, squatter camps and rural areas with no or very little hope of ever having a rewarding career or a dignified lifestyle. And here's the crux. We, as the middle class, is, have hold the Constitution in very high esteem. It, we cling to it as our rock of stability. How can we blame people who have no hope of ever finding a rewarding life and dignity to cling on to that same Constitution? To them, it is becoming a piece of paper. We are in the fortunate position that we could afford 18 billion rand to pay in social grants and so address extreme poverty but we have not addressed inequality in any substantial way, and that is our biggest threat. The poorest 50% of the population still get less than 8% of the national income. Most South Africans would agree that education was our biggest failure. But after extensive research that I had done for that book, I came to the conclusion that the education departments, nationally and provincially, have not been worse than the rest of the civil service. We only think they're worse because we feel stronger, because they handle our children, and we can actually measure the successes or failures through literacy and numeracy tests and the metric results. So the party that is most certainly going to emerge victorious after the election only has one plan to rescue out of us out of this cul-de-sac we are in the National Development Plan. As one of only seven people in the country who had actually read the whole NDP document, I can say it is a good blueprint with honest analysis and some very smart and workable ideas. Here's the problem though. When the cabinet ministers have their fancy suits on, they tell us that the, the National Development Plan is their policy, government policy, ANC policy. Then half of those people, very same people, take their suits off and they put red t-shirts on with a hammer and sickle on them and those very same people say no, no, this is a DA cut and paste and it will have to be renegotiated. And so the NDP, the National Development Plan, doesn't really figure in the election campaign of the ANC or for that matter by, of any other political party. And the media have been very unsuccessful in keeping uh, parties and the ANC to the National Development Plan and reminding us that that is our lodestar accepted by most. The proposal to, to uh, let me say this, the, even if the ANC wants to renegotiate parts of the National Development Plan, there are major parts that could be implemented immediately. Here's an example. There's a proposal that land redistribution, one of our burning issues, should be devolved to local district committee, committees in every agricultural district in the country and that they should uh, handle it. It is a brilliant plan that has been accepted uh, by organized agriculture and yet we see no move to implement this. Instead, a new plan is now being floated that says 50% of all farms should be transferred to the ownership of farm workers, an unworkable plan that is creating a lot of insecurity in the sector. Let's turn to the media. How has the media helped the voting public to understand the political dynamics, the real dynamics and, and the real issues? I'm afraid to say that our newspapers have not adapted well to the virtual monopoly on breaking news by Twitter, Facebook and in a sense radio and 24-hour television. Every morning I look at most newspapers and see them repeating the news that I had taken note of uh, as it was happening. I want to know more than that. I want to know what yesterday's news means. Somebody told me on Twitter something is happening. 
Tomorrow morning, I want a good analysis context. What is the background? What are the different interpretations of this event? What was the context? Context. Where will it lead us? Some papers, of course, do that, but not enough, and often not in a format that ordinary voters can want to read. Daily Maverick is an exception. It has become essential reading for those who want to know more than what politician X and politician Y had said yesterday, or what party A or party B uh, said in their press statements. Daily Maverick has a good mix of information, credible analysis, and stimulating opinion, and they know better than to clutter their pages with factual reports of events that readers took note of the previous day. I think Daily Maverick has filled a void in our media landscape, and it serves as an example to others on how to make quality, quality journalism accessible. Its reporting and analysis of Marikana uh, was an example of brilliant and essential journalism. It, Daily Maverick's design uh, is regarded worldwide as groundbreaking and as being uh, emulated everywhere. So I do want to pay tribute to Branco and his team uh, with limited resources. They, they didn't have... Thank you. They didn't have the millions of, of Media24 or uh, Times Media or any of these other houses, and yet they are in the forefront of informing us and helping us form an informed opinion. Not that I want to rubbish all my other colleagues in journalism. There's still a small band of brave and skilled investigative journalists out there who do their job at some risk, day in and day out. And we as citizens owe them a debt of gratitude because without them, we would not know half of the stuff those in authority in government and in business didn't want us to know. I would, and I think I speak now as a what I would call a seasoned journalist, what others would call a boring old fart, I would really appreciate it if our investigative reporters would put as much effort into investing, investigating corruption, abuse and exploitation among the business community as they put into state corruption and abuse. But there are, sadly, too many reporters out there who know nothing else but to skim the surface, too many young reporters, talented but with no memory of what came before them, and no realization that they have to dig deep and they have to understand much more when they, when they report. Uh, they need to know the background to everything. I think our media has helped promote the post paul Aquinas culture that you can become famous and dominate the headlines if you're militant, if you insult and you threaten. But if you're just a politician putting forward your policies and ideas, he will be ignored. Um, Cope complains of this. Achang complains of this. The DA, even some ANC politicians. Uh, I saw yesterday that Mr. Sparks in his column on Business Day also pointed to a comprehensive set of anti-poverty uh, proposals by the DA that was completely ignored by the media. There is another media institution besides Daily Maverick that I would like to, re to commend, and that is the online Africa Check. They take public claims by individuals, companies, government, or political parties, and check, do research, and check if they spoke the truth or not. I would really like to see more of this in our daily media. Um, what we really needed in the last few years, and indeed now in the run-up to this election, was a professional and respected public broadcaster. Sadly, the SABC is certainly not one of the good stories we can tell of the last few years. We know it could have worked, because for a short Prague spring between 1994 and 1998, when Zulaki Sisulu headed the organization, it was a public broadcaster with integrity and clean administration, independent, professional, independent of any political party. But once Zulaki left, the commissars took over, they worked out most journalists with experience and integrity, and it became a proper old state broadcaster, and a proper old mess, as you all know. And the ANC majority in Parliament keep on appointing the board, the, the ANC majority in Parliament who appoint the board of the SABC keep on repeating the same mistakes over and over. But let's take television, let's stick to television for a second. 
here is, to me, the curious thing. Television has done things with the Oscar Pistorius trial that have mesmerized people, made them think, helped them understand, and stimulated ideas. I watched a bit of the special Oscar Pistorius channel yesterday. It had fascinating roundtable discussions with lawyers and reporters and editors and forensic experts, psychologists, and specialists. They do this every day. There's a lot of live reporting, but there's also a lot of backstories about context and an exchange of opinion. And why, oh why, can't we see the same innovation and commitment to good television treatment of current affairs and election issues? Have we really become a tabloid nation obsessed with celebrities? Talk radio uh, is an interesting um, instrument of our democracy. Um, I was traveling from the airport last night. It did take me two and a half hours at 10 o'clock last night from the airport to Melville because there was some problem on the road, which I, being from Cape Town, I'm not really used to. Um, but radio has become a, a, a very strong pillar of our democracy because it's instant democracy. And people feel the freedom to talk, uh, to phone in, and to speak their minds. I think the recent edition of Power FM, uh, beyond 702 and Cape Talk, and also the, some of the other stations, make a major cons contribution. I would love to see, though, a good analysis of the role that the radio stations, the SABC radio stations, in indigenous language, languages play. They, the most important source for most South Africans, mo source of information for most South Africans, especially in the rural area. Similarly, I would love to see an in-depth analysis of the role and influence on opinion during this election campaign of Twitter and Facebook. And I suspect we underestimate the potential power of these social media. The EFF uh, seems to realize that this is important. I tweeted yesterday a quote from Dalian, uh, Dalian Porfu at the 702 uh, hall meeting where he said, if one citizen lives in squalor, I live in squalor. And yeah, of course we get what he was saying, but I thought it was appropriate to say, Dali, you don't live in squalor. You're a multimillionaire. And within an hour, I was inundated with literally dozens and dozens of people protesting, EFF people, as even a Dali Mpofu for Premier group on Twitter. So here we go, 28, before, 28 days before the election. It's an exciting time, and it will be a very important election which will shape our political landscape in the five years to what could very well be the crunch election in 2019. But this election could also serve to diffuse some of the political tension in the country and prepare the ground for a real a realignment of political forces over the next few years. I find it sad that we will go to vote on the 7th of May not with a new electoral system, that we're still stuck with a representational uh, system. Years ago, Tabo Mbeki appointed uh, Fancel Slobert to investigate this. He brought out a very smart, very intelligent, comprehensive report saying the ideal for South Africa would be a combination of constituency representation, which is good for accountability, and uh, representation, proportional representation, to make sure that some of the smaller voices also have a, have a vote. I, I hope when we stand here again before the next election, we will have that kind of electoral system. I personally, make, uh, I personally hope Julius Malema will make it to Parliament and that the EFF will at least have 10, 15, 20 members elected to Parliament. And I hope that the Freedom Front uh, makes it to Parliament and has at least five, and I hope the ACDP and ZAPO and the PAC make it to par Parliament. It is of crucial importance in our country at this point that most citizens, if not all citizens, will, will be able to say, I have a voice in Parliament. I have someone speaking on my behalf in the most important law-making body in the country. It would be good for democracy, it would be good for stability, and it would be good for Parliament. It is time that we restored Parliament uh, to the prestige it once had. It will also, to have all these people in Parliament, show the hotheads that there's a difference between sitting in endless portfolio committees and studying draft legislation 
and making fiery speeches at public rallies. Remember, talking now about the EFF, Julius Malema walking into Parliament makes me think of exactly 20 years ago. Exactly 20 years ago, the, there was a party called the Volksfront under Constant Fillion. They had mobilized uh, half of the army, the old white SADF, all the farmers, old commando systems. They trekked out to Botswana. They were going to spoil our, our, our democracy. They were going to possibly even seize power. And then at the last minute, those very same people, Constant Fillion and his sidekick, uh, Peter Mulder, decided they're going to pay, take part in the election and they're going to go into parliament. And look how they have become, our only version of a right wing, have become part of the system. Peter Mulder is even a deputy minister in the ANC cabinet. I'm personally looking forward to the day that Comrade Bladen Zimande of the Communist Party and uh, Commander-in-Chief Julius Malema of the EFF would face each other in debate in Parliament. Because we're going to see Julius, the, na the nationalist, who, want, who wants mines and banks to be nationalized, and we will have Blade, the communist, who will have to defend his government stance that nationalization is not government policy. <laughs> so let the games begin. And after listening to Ridi Klabi and Aki Anastasio yesterday, who tried to calm down the, the, uh, the crowds with vivas, let me just say, viva Daily Maverick, viva. Thank you.